Hello, and thank you for inviting me to this year's Macular Society Conference. Uh, my name is Richard Slowcock, and I am a visually impaired climber on the GB climbing team. Um, so I'm a para climber. So what is para climbing? Well, basically, para climbing is climbing for those with disabilities. Um, and on the team, we have people that have uh, amputations, people with neuro neuro neurological disorders, and also people who are visually impaired. And I fall into the category of B2. So there's three different categories, B1, B2, and B3, and I fit in B2, which has a, um, a level of sight between um, 1 by 60 and 3 by 60. Um, and basically what we do is we climb on walls inside and outside, um, we use ropes and the walls can be anywhere up to 20 meters. And the competition is basically two qualifiers to see how far you can get. Uh, and then a final where basically you don't get to see the route. Well, I wouldn't get to see the route anyway. Um, but then you will um, have a look at the route with uh, the coach. You'll go through it. You'll work out what you're going to do. You have six minutes to do that. And then you get basically come out more or less uh, blind. Uh, and, uh, and and climb the route. So I have a site guide uh, who's one of the coaches. So we work very closely together. We wear headsets. So I have a headset and he has a headset uh, and we communicate via radio. And he basically tells me where I'm going to go. So at the beginning, we'll sit there. We'll decide how we're going to climb it, what the route looks like, what the holds look like and how we're going to how we're going to climb it and how we're going to get as far as we possibly can. Um, and then while doing the route, he'll give me directions on which hand goes where where I'm moving my feet and um, also which direction the climb is going to go and what the hold looks like as well. Because obviously the holds can be very different um, when compared to each other. And pockets can be very, very difficult because you're trying to get your hand to go in a very specific place. Um, and that's basically what we do. So I'm very lucky in the respect that I get to climb uh, internationally and nationally. So I've been all over the world on the, with the GB team. Um, and it's been a fantastic experience um, over the last five years since I joined the team. I've managed to push myself and develop my climbing abilities. I used to climb when I um, when I could see, but I trained to the level that I train now. Uh, and it's basically allowed me to push myself to the point where now I'm world number two. And I've just come back from uh, Austria uh, and also from Switzerland this year where I got uh, a silver in, in Innsbruck, uh, a gold in uh, Imst in Austria, and then a gold in Villars in Switzerland. So it's been a really good season for me. Um, although there's been lots of injuries, so uh, I'm gonna have to recover now and, and carry on. So uh, my diagnosis story um, started in probably 2013, around that sort of time. And I noticed while working, so I worked at Rolls-Royce at the time, I was very, very um, computer heavy. So I spent a lot of time on the computer and I noticed that I was really struggling to find the cursor. So it, it got to the point where I thought there was something wrong. And for some reason, I thought, oh, I'll close my right eye and look through my left eye. And I noticed there was a big black, big black mass in the middle of it um, and things didn't look quite right. So. I went to see the opticians and um, they didn't know what it was. So they referred me to Derby Hospital. Um, they didn't know what it was. So they thought, um, you know, they, in fact, one of the questions they asked was, has anyone shone a laser pen in your eye? Um, which obviously they hadn't. So they didn't really understand what it was because my right eye was still fine, but my left eye was getting worse. Um, and they pushed me to go to Nottingham. Nottingham diagnosed me with some form of macular dystrophy. And um, by this time, my left eye was getting worse and my right eye was now starting to catch up. And the one piece of advice they said was that um, things are going to deteriorate very quickly. They tend to do with these sorts of things. They had no idea why it was happening, but they, uh, they, they said, you know, things are going to get worse very, very quickly. And I remember uh, looking at, at things and with my left eye, there were lots and lots of wavy lines and nothing looked straight anymore. And it was like looking through almost water but my right eye was still fine. Um, and they referred me to try and find out a little bit more information to more fields in London. <clears throat> so this was all starting in around 2014. Um, and by the time I got to see Professor Webster in London in, in uh, September 2015, 
my right eye was just as bad as my left. Um, I was still driving at the time, which he was very, very shocked to hear. Um, and uh, they instantly said that I would be registered as um, partially sighted uh, because my sight had deteriorated so much uh, and told me I couldn't drive anymore, which was a massive shock to me. Um, but basically that was it. They then, they then um, put me into a trial with Genetics England because they wanted to find out what it was because they had absolutely no understanding of why it had happened. Um, I'd not seen any issues growing up. Um, and it has suddenly happened while I was in my early 30s. So uh, they wanted to find out what it was. So I did some genetic trials with myself and my parents. And it basically came back as there was a recessive gene on my father's side that um, had become dominant in me. It's a CRX gene and um, very similar to Stargardt's, but it happened very, very late in, uh, in my life uh, and in my career, um, which I was very lucky in some aspects because I'd obviously gone through school, I'd gone through university, I'd been able to drive, uh, and also I got myself a career at Rolls-Royce. So I was in a very lucky position. That said, there were some serious dark days when the, um, when the diagnosis came. Obviously, the, the run-up to seeing Professor Webster in London, there was a lot of uncertainty. My mood was starting to um, become very... Um, changeable, I suppose, is the, is the way as I started to fall into some forms of depression. Um, and I tried to push it down and block it out and, and really ignored it as much as I could, uh, which is probably why I was still driving at the time, because I, you know, I wanted to make sure that I could carry on and, and didn't want to admit that there was a problem, really. Um, and it wasn't until I saw Professor Webster in London that it really, that was it, you know, this is it, there is a problem, you're going to have to face facts that things are going to change quite significantly as you um, as you move on through life. <clears throat> so um, it got to the point where I would say I was probably on a knife edge. Um, either I made a decision and did something to try and sort things out, or I would fall off that knife edge and things would get much, much worse. Um, and I was very lucky in the respect that because I worked for such a big company, they had uh, an employee assistance program, which basically um, was a phone number that anyone in the company and their family and friends could ring um, to get help. Um, and I remember, you know, making that phone call was probably the hardest thing I ever did because it was, you know, I, I was I was the sort of person that never asked for help. Um, I was always a person that helped everyone else. I was very good at DIY and everything else. So I'd always go around and help people do um, jobs around their houses and you know, having all that taken away was going to be was very difficult for me. So admitting that there was a problem was probably the hardest thing that I had to do. So I rang this number um, and obviously they they helped me significantly. They gave me a counsellor to talk to who specialised in sight loss um, and things started to progress from there. And, uh, you know, and I would say that that was probably the biggest step in uh, in things moving in the right direction because I really wasn't accepting it. I wasn't um, coming to terms with anything. And to a certain extent, I would say, uh, I still haven't come to terms with it. You know, it's uh, 2015, so what, seven years ago, there are still things that I find very, very difficult and things that really put me in, uh, in a bad mood and, and upset me significantly. Obviously, the fact that I couldn't drive, so I obviously had to sell my car and had that complete loss of control was probably the biggest thing for me. Um, you know, the fact that you wanted to go somewhere, you just hop in the car, off you go, you go and do something, you come back and it's, you know, there's no problems associated with it. But now it's, it's a much more in-depth planning event on how I'm going to get to a bus, get on the bus. Um, is the bus going to turn up? Am I going to get a taxi? Does the taxi turn up on time? So instead of going to uh, an appointment within 10 minutes, you have to leave a, you know, a significant amount of time, which I'm sure everyone appreciates. Um, because it is a significant um, effect. To, and it's very frustrating when, when you try and plan something and then everything falls apart because of things that are outside of your control. And I think that was probably the biggest thing for me was the lack of control and trying to take back as much control as I possibly could. Um, but I think having spoken to the council, that was definitely the right thing to do. So it helped me to, to move forwards and understand um, you know, what I can do and how I can come to terms with things and how I can deal with things. 
Uh, and it's made me a very different person. I'm much more open. I'm much, much happier talking about things. Before, I would never really talk about feelings or anything like that. Or, you know, I was quite a closed book, really. And I'm much more open now. Uh, and, I'm, you know, I'm very uh, happy to talk to anyone about things and help them if, they, if, if they're in a similar situation. Because I think when you're in that situation, it's very difficult and very hard to be able to see a way out. It, you know, everything becomes very dark and, and, you know, you think that this is the end of the world. You start to catastrophize on things and that's it. So it's very difficult to see um, that things can get better. And, and that's, I think, probably the one thing I would take from everything is that, you know, things will get better. You know, once, you, once you've come to terms with things, it will be difficult. But um, once you start to move forwards and, and come to terms with uh, what's happening, maybe not accept it because it is very difficult to accept at times. But once you come to terms with it and you start to move on, that's when things start to get better. Um, and that's really where the climbing came in. So, you know, I really enjoyed climbing before I lost my sight. And one of the things I was really worried about was that I wouldn't be able to climb anymore. And, that, you know, that was it. And of course, I'd never heard of the paraclimbing team or um, uh, climbing for people with disabilities and visual impairment. So it really hadn't even dawned on me at that time. Um, and I'd always been fairly fit in some aspects. So I thought, well, Maybe there's maybe there's some way in which I can you know I can move forwards. Maybe I can now join a, a sports team or something, and I might not be the best from an able body perspective, but then maybe from a visually impaired perspective, I am. So maybe I can look at doing something different. So they just opened a velodrome in Derby. I thought, well, maybe I could do that, or maybe I can start playing visually impaired cricket or visually impaired football or something like this. Um, and it wasn't until someone um, spoke to me and said, have you thought about doing visually impaired climbing? And obviously I'd never heard of it, didn't even know it existed. So I um, went along to the series that we had in, um, in the UK. So there were four competitions in 2017, yeah, one in Manchester, one in Leeds, one in London and one in uh, Sheffield. And I had a fantastic time. Um, I learned a lot. I got to, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very odd situation because until you're in a situation where you're surrounded by people with disabilities, it, it, it's very um, unusual, you know, and everyone looks different. Everyone's got arms and legs missing. And it, if you've never been in that situation, it's quite strange, but it's very natural now. I don't even bat an eyelid when I see someone with no legs or an arm missing or someone else who's visually impaired. And it's really great to be in that uh, environment with people that, have similar issues, but have a, a, a similar goal uh, and push themselves to try and become uh, the best of what, what they can do. You know, take what they've been given, take, you know, you've been given lemon, so let's make some lemonade. Um, and that's when I joined the, the GB team. So they put me on the team for 2018 because I did so well in the 2017 series. Um, I did some competitions in 2018. Um, uh, didn't do as well as I'd hoped, so I got world number seven. Uh, and I really pushed very hard uh, to try and get you know better, much better. And then by 2019, I got world number three. Then we had the whole COVID issue and, and that sort of put a stop to everything. But this year I've come back. So last year we went to Russia at the end of the year um, for, the, for the last Russian world championship. Uh, and I got uh, world number two there. And then this year we've had the World Cups where, like I said before, I've got uh, a silver and two golds. So things are really moving in the right direction, but uh, I'm now 42 and things are starting to break uh, and uh, starting to hurt a little bit more as I'm getting a bit older, uh, especially as I'm competing against guys in their early 20s. And uh, it's, you know, they're, they're a lot fitter than I am. So I'm really having to push myself quite hard just to keep up. But yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's given me something to drive towards and really something to focus on, especially as... Uh, at the beginning of last year, I retired from Rolls Royce as well. So again, very lucky in the respect that I worked for such a big company uh, and they had a great medical severance package because I just got to the point where using a laptop from day to day was just absolutely impossible. And it got to the point where I just really couldn't continue anymore. Um, and I was doing very technical stuff. So it was really, really difficult for me to, uh, to try and do anything else. So I was very lucky in the, res in the respect that they retired me early. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, it, the climbing's really given me something to focus on and really push through 
Um, and it's something that I love as well. So uh, I'm very lucky in that respect that uh, I managed to find that and carry on. So what next? Well, we've obviously had the season this year and I've really enjoyed it. I've done fairly well. Um, I've come away with some, some injuries, which I need to work through and need to try and repair for going forwards. Um, but next year we have a, another world championship. So it's the big one from a paraclimbing perspective at the moment. Um, so that will be in Switzerland, uh, I think in September next year. So I'll drive towards that, do a few more World Cups as well, um, and hopefully improve on world number two. But uh, again, it's it, I'm not getting any younger in the guys that I'm competing against. So the guy who's number one, I think, is is 22. So um, it's a it's a real struggle to keep up with these youngsters. Um, and going forwards, uh, hopefully. Uh, Olympic, the, the uh, climbing, able body climbing is now in the Olympics. So by 2028, we're hoping that the para climbing will also be in the Paralympics, but we need to make sure we meet all the minimum criteria and things like that. So hopefully uh, that will happen, whether I'm still on the team or not. Um, probably not. It's uh, quite a way off. I'll be 48 by then. So uh, um, maybe not competing or maybe not at the level that I could uh, win, but uh, I'd love to be involved. So we'll see what happens. Um, but yeah, it's been, uh, it's been a really good journey. Um, obviously the dark days were the greatest, but I've, I've come out the other side now uh, and I can definitely say that uh, I'm moving forwards with the right frame of mind. So thank you very much for having me and letting me tell you my story. Um, and that's been great. Thank you.